So today we're talking to Tom Egan, uh, Vice President of Industry Services at PMMI. The focus here is going to be on automation and is it going to save us, replace us? Like, what does it really mean and and how does it impact the packaging industry? Tom, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, thanks. Awesome. So can you quickly in a minute, tell us how you landed the job that you're doing today? Okay, so PMMI is a trade association. We have over a thousand member companies who provide all sorts of equipment and material and service solutions to consumer packaged goods companies globally. I had been involved with one of the member companies before joining the staff of the trade association. Been here about 20 years and and love the whole of all things uh, packaging and processing. So for me, it's it's yeah. fun. And what, so PMI being a trade association, like for those of us that don't know, that aren't familiar with PMI, what does it encompass? So uh, as a trade association, our uh, members are actually companies that provide those different types of solutions that I mentioned, equipment, services, mm-hmm. and materials. And so uh, most of our businesses are uh, based in North America, the vast majority of our member companies. And uh, PMMI, as the trade association, helps to provide services in furtherance of business generally, that is to help the whole of the packaging industry. So for example, we have some really strong workforce uh, education programs that go from, uh, especially in the past couple of years, working with uh, middle school and high school programs to advance uh, manufacturing, as well as work with uh, two and four year universities. We also are the owners of and uh, organizers of a very large trade exhibition called Pack Expo. And then uh, we provide uh, business reports for our members having to do with markets and the opportunities to expand. Uh, so it's a, it's a varied uh, group of services that uh, PMMI uh, offers to its uh, member companies. The conversation that we're going to have is about artificial intelligence, or not artificial intelligence, but maybe we'll touch on it a little bit, but automation. Right. And these are things that people are talking about. I know that from a manufacturing standpoint, something that we're talking about, um, a lot of times people hear automation and they think job replacement, right? They, oh, you're automating. So it's going to, it's going to eliminate my position, but it kind of seems to be like that's what's happening in reverse, right? It's harder to find people and we're, we're having to focus on automation. Uh, Bailey, you've absolutely hit the, the crux of the issue. Automation helps to provide more and more of the products to us as consumers. So when we go away from our uh, jobs, then we're also the consumer, right? We want what we want, when we want, and how we want it. And the automation that the PMMI member companies provide helps to deliver that for us as consumers. Uh, The second part that you referenced had to do with the challenges of attracting uh, the labor right now. And you can look at all sorts of studies going even back into the middle of 2021 Mm -hmm. that say that there is a strong labor shortage, a severe labor shortage in manufacturing to the point that there will be hundreds of thousands of jobs short uh, in the labor needed for manufacturing industries across the board, not just packaging and processing by 2030. Automation helps us and helps the companies to provide those goods and services that we all want. So people don't want to work, right? Like that's kind of what, that's what it seems to come down to. I know that's not the topic here, but that's always like mind blowing. We can't find people to fill the positions, but it's not just this industry. And what are, what are these people doing? (laughs) I want that job. Yeah, it's uh, it, it is a challenge there uh, with, with all sorts of uh, different opportunities. The growth of businesses, yeah. the reshoring of some manufacturing that's been yeah. occurring in the past couple of years, and the opportunity for very well-paying jobs. The outlook on working in manufacturing is definitely changing, and the same is with packaging and processing. It, I, I'm probably uh, biased in my approach. It's fun okay, yeah. to take a look and see 
products that you and your family use at the end of the day, either at home or at the restaurant, however it is that you're getting food and beverages and over-the-counter products and your household and personal care products, all of those are market segments that use packaging and processing. And so it's fun to be working in that area and then to see those products in the daily use where you are actually using them yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that um, packaging design is a superpower. It's a superpower in that like I can, I'm transporting myself into the future and pretty much across the entire planet. Right. So what I'm designing today isn't going to hit the market for another six to eight months. And I've got to make decisions at my desk on color, branding, materials, construction, manufacturing that will help get that product to shelf in six to eight months in the future distributed around the planet. And the decisions that I make are going to convince somebody somewhere, some part of their day to pull that product off the shelf and buy it, right? Like that's the power is that a packaging, you know, that somebody in the packaging industry has is you're not just designing something for today. It's like, how am I going to get that person that I've never met to pull this off the shelf and make a purchasing decision, actually put money on the table um, to buy this product? I I love that concept, right? That that superpower, because it does represent the need uh, to design the packaging in order to attract the consumer's eye and interest to convey very quickly what it is that the product will do for you. The packaging that is carrying the product is what is helping you as a consumer make that decision. So when you're doing packaging design and when you're coming up with the final uh, approach or the final package that's going to be on the retail shelf or through e-commerce, yeah. you need to have that so that the consumer can readily identify what is in the package and how that will meet whatever need they may have. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so in terms of automation, right? I think as a packaging, if, if I've got my packaging designer hat on and I hear automation, my understanding of automation doesn't go that far, right? It's going to be, you know, I'm picturing production techniques for, for manufacturing, whether it's printing, maybe like an inline, um, you know, foil stamping, like it kind of limits it to, to that range as a designer. If I put my engineering hat on, it, it's like, okay, well, now we've got a little bit more happening there, but it's still kind of limited to that production. What other areas are being automated that may be impacting me as a designer that I'm not even considering? So one item to really think about is just the automation that's necessary before you get to the final package. Mm -hmm. For example, when we're filling beverages, they are often filled at a thousand or more bottles or cans a minute. And in order to be able to do that, you need an entire production sequence that's highly automated and very efficient. You're turning out uh, products that uh, need to get filled and, and then capped or a, a top put on them in the case of a can. Then they need to be grouped together and then put into the carton, which is what you and I as a consumer are going to yeah. take. So you're thinking about the end result, which is what is actually on the shelf, thinking about the packaging that goes into what has to happen or what has to make the reality of whatever product you're going to actually purchase yeah. is where some of the challenges are. It's some of the excitement that you see in, in what it is that uh, all of the companies involved in providing that product uh, do every day. And it, it's it's fascinating to see. It really requires that engineering and automation thinking to understand how I'm going to take various packaging components, a bottle, a can, a cap, a label, mm -hmm. and put them together into a carrier that I can pick up at the retail store or perhaps two or three or four or five different packages in a larger carton if I'm buying them in bulk. So it is a, it, it is a fascinating concept with many different areas that are needing expertise yeah. and needing a really a professional eye to approach. 
Okay. So then if I'm thinking of, of it from a designer standpoint, I really need to have a conversation if I'm designing a bottle, right? And a lot of times, a lot of times most brands, including, you know, the big brands like the, the Cokes and the Gatorades and all that sure. good stuff, they're going to just use an off the shelf bottle, right? Cause the cost to tool something new is, you know, pretty outrageous and they want to just test the market with something that's existing. Maybe kind of just do a little tweak, but we're seeing a lot of like startups that are trying to customize packaging and they're hiring, you know, amazing designers that maybe don't have experience in this automation. So they may be designing something that won't work through uh, like this type of a automated filling station, right? So as a designer, it's important that you have a conversation with everybody in, in the entire supply chain, you know, reach out to the glass bottle manufacturer, reach out to the filling, figure out how it's going to work, you know, show them your initial concept so that your product will work through the automation. Otherwise your design is going to be the bottleneck in, you know, no pun intended, is going to be the bottleneck in actually being able to produce at, at scale. It's, it's to produce at scale. You and I individually or together as a team could come up it, with one of the most beautiful and dynamic looking packages right. for soap or for a beverage right. that you would ever want to have. In order to make it commercially viable, you're not going to sell one. You need to sell <laughs> hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. Right. And they need to be filled and capped and packaged properly. So the point that you're raising there is an outstanding un element of the understanding that a packaging designer has to think not just about what will be attractive to the consumer's eye, but also what will be workable or usable, manufacturable, if you will, throughout the entire production process. And that's that great distinction. As I started, you and I could make this gorgeous looking package. We need to be able to make tens of thousands of them. And how will that work in an automated process? September 11th through the 13th, we've got uh, PAX, PAX Expo in Vegas. Are we going to be able to see some of this automation in action? You can. It's a, PAX Expo Las Vegas is a very large trade exhibition. We'll have over 2,000 exhibitors that are displaying the different solution ideas that you and I are talking about. Many of them have working equipment on the production floor, so you can see the concept. The idea is that as a potential purchaser, if you're involved in a, a professional firm that's, that's making a product for the consumer marketplace, you're looking for the solution that will help bring your product to market, and you want to see those different machines in operation. So we have many, many, many machines on the floor and you'll be able to see them. Some are doing what are called cycling. So you can see what it would look like in operation and some run actual samples so that as you're walking around the show floor, you're able to capture and see, hey, that bottle looks like mine or that's the kind of package that I really want to have for the marketplace. Tell me more about what you're doing there. Tell me more about how you would work with my product. And that's part of the value of the trade exhibition. Of course, there's still materials mm -hmm. and there's still service solutions like package design firms where they're offering many different ideas. And PMMI is bringing for the first time uh, here at Pack Expo Las Vegas, a very large display that we are calling Sustainability Central. And it's to advance some of the really strong ideas in sustainability so that the attendee, those involved in packaging, yeah. can understand what some of the latest ideas are and apply them to their product. Uh, so, all right, again, designer hat on. When I first hear of Pack Expo, I don't get excited, right, as a, as a packaging designer. I think this is equipment, it's the manufacturing, it's the unsexy side of packaging. And then I think of the other packaging conferences out there where I can go and I can sit and, you know, watch some famous designer that I'm, that I'm inspired by basically show me their portfolio and tell me like two or three stories about how they got there. And then I walk home and I'm like inspired. Inspiration's great. But, you know, three days later, I'm like, well, what did I really learn? Like, what can I take from that and apply? And if I think of it as, you know, going to Pack Expo, not 
looking for that inspiration from, you know, a designer, but really looking at as a solution to making me a better designer. So it sounds like I can walk through the floor. I can talk to some of these bottling people. I can find out limitations. I can figure out what does and what doesn't work. You know, what sizes make sense in terms of like, you know, openings, what are, what are minimums, what are maximums on some of these different things? What are tolerances and make myself a more, a better versed designer in production is always a better designer uh, on the design side, right? And from a creative standpoint, because there's no point in coming up with something that you can't produce and being able to go to the source and find out you can't produce these types of things. Here's what you can produce and finding those limitations. I think that that is something that maybe we can work on to get that message out. But I think from a, uh, a junior designer, a senior designer, a student going to Pack Expo to see the stuff actually happening. And again, it's not the sexy side, but it's the it's what makes everything so sexy. It's like you can't have these bottles on shelf if you don't know how to make them and produce them and get them filled. Um, yeah. So it's definitely I, something I, you've got to do. I, no, I, I'll say, I'll right. say be inspired. Come right. with that inspiration. Then just as you're talking about work on the, hey, what are the practical implications yeah. about how I'm getting it into the package? I'll offer one other thing. At Pack Expo, we have an area that has some globally award-winning designs. Yeah. So in addition to here's the practical way of actually getting it to market, take a look at those from other areas of the country, from mm -hmm. other areas of the world, and say, that's different. That's a unique idea. Yeah. Let me take that away. And you absolutely can do that and continue that inspiration at Pack Expo. Yeah. It, yeah. It's just, it's funny. Cause like I always tell designers, like get, get to the printer, get on the floor with the pressmen, watch them load the machine, watch them, you know, put the ink in, you know, cut the paper, learn about, you know, grain direction, like all these little details, like you, it makes you a better designer to know how everything functions after the fact. And in this case, you can go and you can see all these different processes, things that maybe you didn't even think about or knew that were in your, uh, within your supply chain. And how can you improve your design based on that? So I, I think, you know, again, designers, like you have to go to Pack Expo. Plus it's in Vegas, right? You know, how can you go wrong? How can you go wrong? I, I, well, again, I'm biased. Regardless of where it would be, we also have one in Chicago. In the even years, I say go be inspired. There are the uh, inspiration, uh, inspirational ideas. We have, uh, we've done many studies and one of the, takeaways that we have. This is studies of attendees where we interview them, say, hey, what, what did you get out of this? Is they talk about an aha moment. Yeah. And the aha moment is when you're walking down an aisle, perhaps it was not to see a specific exhibitor. You just wanted to see what was going on and you stop and see something and go, wait, what? I got to talk to them about that. Yeah. And next thing you know, you're over talking to a company about what it is that they're doing that maybe you didn't think about. And now they have a potential solution that just enhances the value of the package that you're putting onto the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. That again, that that's it. It's like, you got it. You got to go, you got to see this, you know, it's not anything you've ever seen before. You said there's 2000 exhibitors. So it's not even 2000 attendees. This is 2000 exhibitors. Yeah, what, it's what are we talking about attendee wise? Yeah, attendee-wise, we'll talk about more than 30,000 attendees, That's more than 30,000 professionals. It, it's not the point that you're going to meet all 30,000, <laughs> right? You've got stuff you need to do. The big point is the opportunity, though, to do some networking, perhaps to connect with others that you've met in previous uh, work at other businesses. Mm -hmm. But in addition, s sitting, we have on-floor education in a, ver a variety of what we call innovation stages. These are free to everyone. The information about each session is put up online and is put up in all of the, uh, the website that we mm -hmm. have for the show. I'm bringing that up because you as an attendee can show up, sit down at one of these sessions, all free, and meet someone that's next to you that's interested in the same thing. And yeah. pretty soon you're having another professional contact. You might be doing some networking and again, learning how to bring that best product to the marketplace. So 30,000 plus attendees, 2000 plus exhibitors, 
a great professional networking opportunity and really a great series of minds that are all addressing solutions for packaging and processing. All right. So in terms of like the automation, like, you know, it sounds like I can just go out, I can just buy a machine that's going to fold and glue and handle all the different things that I need to do or fill, but it's not that easy, right? Like there's a lot that goes into this. Like you can kind of discover what your obstacles are and how to fix it through automation. And then what's the process of like actually a manufacturer implementing um, some of that automation into their, into their workflow? So it's a great question. We often talk about thinking on what the end is in mind. In mm-hmm. fact, you as the package designer and the, pr- the product delivery company, the consumer package goods firm, aren't necessarily specifically looking for machine XYZ. You may have right. an idea because you've done it before. The idea that you want to go with is I want to turn out so many packages of a tube Mm -hmm. in a carton this big or this many different sizes. Tell me a little bit about the automation that you have available. You know, coincidentally to our discussion today, I I was talking with uh, another professional colleague on a different project and they were describing uh, the steps of automation, if you will, or the levels Mm -hmm. of automation to a, a group of new companies just starting out. And we, we had the same idea. They were talking about how you wrap a pallet of boxes at the end yeah. of the line just before it goes onto the truck. There, you can do that by hand. You can do that in a semi-automated fashion. You can do that in a automated fashion for a single pallet. And you can do it in a highly automated fashion that delivers multiple pallets and automatically brings the next pallet in when one is full and sends that off to the truck. (laughs) I've just described five levels of automation. And what you want to do is to say, here's what I need now. Here's what I'm thinking about as I grow. I may have an immediate need because I'm a startup company, but as I grow, I want to be able to do that automated palletizing Tell me about the solution sets that you have available. And so many different levels of automation are what you can see at a a big trade exhibition and from the companies themselves. Yeah. So then we also hear about, you know, sustainability is huge uh, all around the world, right? In in the U.S., in Europe, in Asia, that's a big topic. Um, People are also talking about automation being a sustainable solution in terms of uh, reducing carbon footprint, you know, if we're looking at solar power, um, just the overall efficiency of it, reducing waste. What's the industry conversation happening in terms of sustainability at this point with automation? Or is there one? So automation does contribute to sustainability. It contributes through efficiency. It contributes to the reduction of waste. It contributes to having, when you think about the uh, different ideas about just what it is that you're going to sell, you're collecting the data about products that have been sold and then replenishing that market with just the right amount for the next selling opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. That is all part of the automation play. Sustainability across the board in the product and in the package is a central element and approach for what it is that we do in packaging. Mm -hmm. I talk about the understanding that it is never an end point. It is a continuous incremental improvement in the automation that's provided and in the packages and products that are available that continue to contribute to sustainability. Sure. I'll give you a, 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 maybe a, a small example. Each time that you think about the uh, something as ubiquitous as a, a water bottle, that cap that goes on the water bottle a number of years ago Uh, they develop what's called a short skirt. It's a much thinner cap. You've seen them. They've been in the marketplace now for years. There was a lot of technology to bring that shorter cap, that shorter skirt cap to the marketplace so that it could be put on at a high enough speed. And that's the type of automation solution, if you will, the type of automation story that really contributes overall to what all of the consumer packaged goods firms are doing with their products. 
I, you want always to have a product that is right for the customer and that is saleable. You and I are not going to accept one that has something like a dent or it looks like it's been creased or crushed. Right. Packaging is what gets all your product safely through the whole of the supply chain to the point of sale and then use by the consumer. Just a side note here. The consumer is not accepting something that has a dent in it or a scratch in it. Uh, I think it's something that we need to work towards changing. What you describe packaging is it's there to protect the product to get from point A to point B. And if the packaging does its job in protecting that product and gets, you know, a couple bumps and bruises on the way, as long as the product is fine, I think consumers should be able to accept it. But we've, we've kind of changed, you know, have, we have this mentality of if the packaging is damaged, then, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to move the front product at the grocery store aside and grab one in the back because that one, you know, hasn't been damaged. And then there's so much waste that comes from just that thinking as well. Um, but people don't really kind of, people never think of that. You know, I know I worked with a brand years ago and we had a locking tuck flap on this product because it just, you know, it was for security and people wanted to smell it. And this, and so the people would open the, the box, they would rip the lock on, on the tuck flap and then they would smell it and they'd put it back in and then they'd grab a fresh one. They hadn't, I mean, they tore it, they damaged it and they would grab a new one. And it was like a 35% return rate on all these products uh, from the retailers. Like, you know, we've got damaged boxes, you got to re replace them. And it was such a crazy cost. We ended up eliminating the, the tuck flap, um, but it was, or the, the locking flap. But it was like, again, it's like the, the bottle inside the box was in pristine condition, but the box had a tear in it because the consumer tore it. Uh, but yeah, just like side side note, not, not to automation, but you know, it's just one of those things. I I think that uh, you're looking at those constant incremental improvements, and you know that there's the scent capability now that you can have with some of the different packages, right? That was I I don't say that it was developed directly as a response to what you're mentioning, but it is that element of being able to provide the scent so that even as the consumers approaching the package, they get the sense, yeah. double meaning there, of what it is that you are offering for sale. And we want, we want our package to be very pristine because we, as the consumer, are paying money for that. So... Yeah, but we're paying for the product, right? And I think that that's the, that's the one thing. Um, but, I th but you know, of course, I want to design something that's going to be beautiful through its entire lifespan. Sure. Um, but sometimes it's like, am I too high and mighty and expecting that and not thinking it's okay for my box to be damaged as long as the product arrives in its perfect form. But in terms of like sustainability, these pieces of equipment are, are massive. And in some instances, what about the energy consumption of this, right? In terms of how much energy is required to operate these? Are we trading one problem for another? Yeah, just as you've seen improvements in all types of packaging material, there are those constant improvements in machinery. We mm -hmm. talk about the use of utilities, wages, water, air, gas, electricity, and steam, the five basic utilities that you might use on a machine. So much has been done to improve the, um, the reduce, um, improve, you, if you will, the utilization of the water, air, gas, electricity, and steam so that any incremental decrease in the amount is an improvement in the machine performance. And there have been tremendous improvements in those machine performances. Things like servo motors and the uh, programming that's available in order to allow a machine to pause when it may not be needed for a particular piece of the operation all contribute to the reduction in the use of the utilities. And that's something that you'll see in any of the machines that uh, will be at, at the trade exhibition in any of the machines that uh, the companies or uh, yes, the companies will be purchasing now. What's the craziest thing that you've seen in terms of automation, right? Like 
that you've heard in, in packaging? <laughs> I, 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 I have to say, I, I'm probably most impressed by speed. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I've seen something crazy. Coincidentally, I visited Hershey uh, this past weekend, and at the Milton Hershey Museum, they had a machine that was one of the first automated machines to wrap Hershey Kisses. Wow. That machine was actually a partial development by the employees of the Hershey company early on in its formation. They took what was a completely manual process and found a way to automate it, to take the Hershey kiss, to put the little wrap piece of, uh, or the little uh, paper, paper wrap yeah. that says Hershey's, and then of course the silver foil, right? When you see that machine and realize that that was done decades ago, I think for me, I don't, know that I could describe the craziest thing. Mm -hmm. For me, it's probably just to, the impressiveness of the speed that you see for so many different operations. So that machine was developed by the employees and did it uh, ultimately replace them? I, it, it ultimately allowed them to do some other jobs. So they right. went on to make some other advancements in the, the whole chocolate process. They, I, it's not for me specifically the promotion as I was impressed by the story that yeah. they that they were sharing. The machine that you you saw there was pretty slick. When the story behind it is that was done by hand, by operators sitting at a table having to grab an individual kiss each time, and now to see that automated to allow what more production of kiss kisses, better distribution, keeping the price low because the automation mm -hmm. had allowed. Uh, a higher uh, quality and quantity of product to be produced. I think you make, you make a great point in bringing an automation to the Hershey plant that was developed by the, 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 that was developed by the employees. Like I said, you know, is it going to replace them? Did they develop the, the machine that's going to replace them? And you know, your response was no, there, it allowed them to do something else. And I think today that's kind of the same mentality that as an employee, um, seeing automation being brought into your plant, you know, if you're like a small manufacturer and you're seeing some of these pieces of equipment coming in, it's all about being a sustainable business, being able to manage your profits, manage your bottom line. This is going to be more efficient. It's going to allow you to do a different job within this operation and continue to grow, right? Because as prices of things go up, we have to find ways to reduce that cost and do more with less. Uh, and I think there's always a fear of bringing in the robots, so whether it's artificial intelligence or automation, you've got to kind of embrace it. The, the you, you bring in automation, think about a, a system that helps to uh, palletize boxes. Mm -hmm. If you're doing repetitive loading of those boxes all during the day, it becomes a, a very labor intensive issue. You are able to put yeah. automation in and now you have somebody that's watching the process the system itself still needs to be monitored. The system itself still has the capability then of producing more output so that you have a chance to run maybe a second line or add a second line to your production to see the growth in your business. And so that is a, it's a, it's an opportunity to generate more jobs. As we yeah. said earlier in our discussion, manufacturing is looking for more workers. It is a more skilled workforce. Yeah. They're using tablets on the production line now. And this is an opportunity to use automation and see the business grow. And as a result, the work team grow and improve. Sure. And what's being done to help uh, the workforce transition? That's a great question. The, the workforce training that's become available now uh, in the past couple of years and the work uh, in reaching out to the middle schools and high schools to show that there's a lot of excitement in manufacturing with STEM programs and different types of learning programs has all contributed to that, if you will, that, that thought change to say, hey, this is something that might be interesting to me. I want to take... Yeah a deeper look at this. The training is a big, big uh, element and beginning with the programs that are being done throughout the uh, high school level and in some cases the middle school and then uh, promoting the idea that these are very good 
uh, paying jobs. They have a great career path and a career opportunity. And they use some latest technology, programming robots, using tablets to look at what are called KPIs, key performance indicators on production lines, perhaps to make an adjustment to a production line itself. Those are all strong capabilities and are using what you and I are used to doing in our consumer uh, in our consumer lives, if you will, away from the sure. job. Yeah. And uh, so from an education standpoint, there's there's outreach at the moment. You're, you're looking at a younger audience to help them kind of work their way into this industry. And I think every industry is doing that at the moment, right? They're, they're, everybody's trying to capitalize on these younger uh, students and, and direct them in different directions because labor shortages 2030 you know, is, is just right around the corner. We got to get people excited about packaging. Um, <laughs> with, <laughs> with that said, uh, as excited as you are and I am about packaging uh, at Pack Expo, you've got a bunch of different stages. You've got the sustainability corner. You know, obviously the focus there is sustainability. Uh, Corey Connors, Adam Peak, myself, and Jonathan Quinn are going to be uh, speaking there. Great, touching lineup. a bunch of sustainable. Yeah, we're super excited. Uh, but we'll be talking about sustainability and packaging. What are some of these other stages that are available for people to come in and, and learn from? So we, we have a couple of different uh, stages. Uh, we, we mentioned briefly about one called the innovation stage. We have another one that's called the industry speaks stage. And this is where uh, thought leaders in the industry, especially other associations, have an opportunity to describe some future ideas, often near future ideas, about uh, what's happening. For example, one group that I'm involved with uh, through PMMI uh, called the Cold Pressure Council works with a, uh, a particular technology called high pressure processing. Yeah. And it's, it's a technology that's been around for 20 years. It continues to expand its reach. And we have an opportunity, the Cold Pressure Council members, to describe what's mm-hmm. happening in HPP. This is new, it's exciting, it's, it's an idea and approach. These are some of the, the stages and, and learnings that are taking place. For the students, let me just jump on that for a second. For a number of years now, PMMI has what's called the amazing packaging race. We bring teams of students mm-hmm. in and they go to multiple exhibitors do a particular task. It may be to connect two wires together. It may be to examine a package and determine that everything is correct about the package. Then get, uh, if you will, a a check or a a, a sticker that says they were uh, there and successfully completed the task and go through. And at the end of it, all the teams get together, those that were able to accomplish all the tasks in a given amount of time are the winning team. The big element, you are learning about actual things in packaging and processing, right? You're learning about a machine, you're learning about a design, you're learning about a concept such as sustainability as the students go through there and they come back and say, boy, that this is, this is a more interesting industry than what I thought it was. Okay. No, that, that's great. Again, like, how can we reach out to these students and help them understand all the potential that pa- that packaging has as an industry? What's the next big thing in packaging automation, and how is that going to affect our planet? Yeah, I, I think there there'll be an increasing amount of uh, use of robotics. That's mm-hmm. going to be the the biggest element. You say, Tom, robots have been in in packaging for twenty years. Accurate. What you see now are the opportunity for robots to work together on a packaging line to be even more efficient, to be uh, delivering even that more uh, perfect package, if you will, and the safe product to the marketplace. I I don't know that I I use some time in my examples, I call it lighter than air packaging. I don't think we're there yet, right? I I, I don't. I uh, But... The idea is that the in, the improvements that are being made and the new ideas that are coming out uh, in packaging will continue to uh, advance, and they're just they're exciting. They they offer new ideas. They offer a better delivery mechanism. They offer a better product to the consumer that that works a little better. I'm, I, you don't need to use this in the in the discussion, but I'll go back one. I used to talk about the the first time that I had the uh, the WD40 product, 
mm-hmm. and they had added the straw. Now, when you when you used WD forty before, it worked, but you sometimes yeah. had the spray all over. Right. You put that straw in, and you go, "Geez, it's directed to exactly the hinge that I want, the screw that I wanted." That was pretty slick. It wasn't that it was this enormous breakthrough in X Y Z. It was a different packaging configuration, yeah. and as a result, what a great opportunity to improve the use of that product for the consumer. So not one that's eye-opening or somebody's going no. to turn around and say, I never <laughs> saw that before. <laughs> but boy, what a what a great way and a, a nice little incremental improvement for the consumer. That's the beauty of packaging. Right? That's the power of packaging, right? Just adding that straw, changing the cap to accept that straw made all of the difference, right? And it made using the product a pleasure because now you don't have to you don't have to sit there and debate whether or not you want to listen to the squeaky hinge or spray it and then have to clean you know spend the next 20 oh, minutes damn, cleaning all this right? grease off right uh, but it's kind of the same thing with like you know we've seen the ketchup packet from years ago that was went from the squeeze bottle to the little tray and you can tear the corner squeeze it or you can peel it back and dip huge packaging right the other packaging yeah the other example is the oreo container with the tear across the top. Yeah, yeah. Like the old days you would have to tear the end, you'd pull the tray of cookies out, you know, you'd close it up. It would never close the same. The cookies got stale within like a day or two. Huge difference. All packaging. And that guy that came up with it retired like right after. <laughs> he's done. He was he was like, I'm done. Just mic drop. And he's out. Uh, I reached out to I reached out to him down on the podcast. He's like he's like I don't do packaging. He's like, I'm, I've am been retired for years. <laughs> yeah, but that's a, I, I love your idea. I happen to have uh, used that exact uh, package earlier in the home this week, right? <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it, it's just that great convenience yeah. of being able to close it, keep the product fresher and more and enjoyable for a much longer period of time. Yeah. And, and it goes back to automation and knowing you know, he wouldn't be able to have innovated that Oreo pack if he didn't know the full process, right? Correct. He didn't come up with that idea, but if the adhesive on that flap doesn't work or the little perforations on the top don't hold that together through the entire process of filling and, you know, there's so many different push and pull that happens on that pack throughout the process, it never would have happened. So to be a better designer, like you have to know what's happening with that pack throughout its life cycle. How is it being filled? How is it being packed? How is it being, you know, put into master cartons? Like so many different things happen. What's the equipment that's grabbing it? Is it, is there a potential for scuffing? Is there a potential for like damp? Like there's so many different things that a designer, as a designer, you don't think of because you're so focused on visual or structural, but what happens after really plays a role, should play a role in what you're creating. Abilio, I, I think you've described it perfectly. It is that it got to the consumer. Now the consumer has to use it and you still want them to have that positive thought about the product, right? right? You found a way to do that. So by using that designer idea and thinking about what it is that the consumer's doing with the package that you are designing and understanding how it gets transported through the whole of the supply chain, great, great. Uh, segments and elements of what the designer has to think about and then what has to become reality to make it work uh, for the consumer. Sure. And maybe you never know, you might be able to retire on your next idea because, you know, you know, manufacturing. (laughs) (laughs) Do the mic drop. (laughs) That's right. Be like, I'm out. That's my, that's my last concept in packaging. I'll see you guys in 20 years. Um, (laughs) Well, Tom, it's been, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I mean, there's so much, in terms of automation that again, as a designer, you need to go and take a look at as a small manufacturer. You know, if you, if you're just a bindery company, that all you're doing is a bindery, like go see what's available out there. Uh, Go get inspired, go to head over to Vegas, September 11th through the 13th and take some pictures, you know, take some pictures, ask some questions, um, post some comments, you know, connect with people and start building your network because Automation's coming. Automation's, it's not coming. It's here. It's here. So get, get, get that aha moment that I mentioned. Take that aha moment and say, 
I just didn't think about or I didn't realize. That's the opportunity of having so many uh, companies together and so many minds that are all involved in the same business in which uh, you're also participating. So I appreciate the opportunity, Avilio. It was a great discussion. I hope that it, uh, a couple of ideas there can spark and that we have a chance. I'm looking forward to seeing you there uh, in Las Vegas at this show. Thank you so much.